Hello everyone, my name is Emily Lipstrow and I'm the Policy Program Coordinator with the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Association. OFA is a grassroots organization of farmers, gardeners, researchers, educators, and others committed to a healthful food system. We provide education to farmers and eaters, host the largest sustainable agriculture conference in Ohio as well. Ohio, our OFA is also one of the oldest USDA organic certification agencies and we've been in operation for more than 35 years. So welcome to our webinar tonight where we're going to be talking about uh, advocacy and what we're going to do is if you have questions anytime throughout the webinar, please type those questions into the question box and we'll hold those questions until the end. Tonight you're going to hear some information about what advocacy is, why it's important, and how you can be successful in advocating for the issues that you care about. This is really a short overview of advocacy. We're really excited to provide uh, a longer and more in-depth advocacy training session at OFA's annual conference on February 13th and 14th of 2016. This two-hour intensive advocacy training is going to be provided um, with facilitation by the National Sustainable Ag Coalition staff. More information about the OFA conference is going to be um, on the OFA website if you're interested in learning a little bit more. So we're going to start tonight by talking about the different forms of advocacy. Usually, advocacy involves getting a large institution to correct an unfair or harmful situation. Usually, we need advocacy when our goals really cannot be achieved any other way. So I'm going to share a few examples, again, of different types or different forms that advocacy can take. And several of these forms really involve different types of education. One of the things that we often have to do is to educate our legislators. An example of how to do that is in February of this year, OFA had commissioned a poll to gauge public support for labeling genetically engineered food. That poll showed that 87% of Ohioans support their right to know what they eat and feed their families. It also showed that it did not matter what political party they belonged to. That poll ended up being a really important educational tool that OFA uses when we talk with legislators about the overwhelming bipartisan support for GE labeling in the state of Ohio. It's also something that you can use as a tool if you're talking or meeting with one of your representatives about GE labeling. Another form of education and advocacy is really uh, more at the community-based level. Community meetings or forums are often held to educate citizens. OFA is hosting movie screenings and discussion groups all over the state of Ohio um, around the issue of GE food. And the annual OFA conference includes a policy track with information on a broad range of food and agricultural issues. So those are a couple of examples about community level education. Another example of what we call nonpartisan education is a new publication that OFA will be coming out with early next year. This is called the Questions for Candidates Guide. The guide will provide an overview of pressing food and agriculture issues 
Along with sample questions, you can ask candidates and representatives at public forums, candidate nights, or at individual meetings. Another important part of um, education and advocacy is teaching people about the legislative process. It's really important to really understand the different stages of the process and who's involved. And a good example of this is um, the Ohio Environmental Council and OFA have held lobby days in the past. This is an opportunity for people to come to the state house, meet with their legislators, learn about how bills move forward in the legislature, and how they can advocate on issues that are important to them. These are really great opportunities for you to learn more about the process, who your representatives are, and really start to develop relationships with them. One of the things that I'd like you to keep in mind, too, is we talk about these different forms of advocacy and how you can be involved, is what kind of training or information would you like to receive after tonight's webinar? If there are specific types of information or training you would like, we'd really like to get that feedback so that you have what you need to move forward. So another type of advocacy really involves doing research. Frequently, we may need to really demonstrate the scale or intensity of a problem or tell the story of what's happening in the economy, the environment, or in the local community. Something that I think a lot of us are familiar with when it comes to advocacy is organizing or attending a rally. That's really a powerful way to advocate and draw attention to a cause. It doesn't matter if that's in Columbus, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Washington, D.C., or whatever your local community is. A rally is a great way to bring people together, gain media exposure, and build support for a cause. Another important way to advocate that very few people take advantage of is through regulation. As agencies develop new regulation or changes to existing law, those rules can have a real impact on what happens in our communities. A current example are two new pipelines that are being proposed to transport fracked gas from Ohio outside of the United States. Specifically, this is the ET Rover and the Nexus Pipelines. These projects are reviewed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And there is currently what they call an open docket right now where you can go in and provide comments. Many people are actively engaged in either opposing these pipelines or requesting root alterations. For more information on how you can comment to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, vi visit OFA's webpage and our policy link for fracking. Sometimes, Advocacy really requires litigation. When an organization or multiple organizations bring litigation against polluters or those harming the community or violating existing law. When most people think about influencing legislation, they usually think of lobbying. Many businesses and organizations lobby legislators directly. There's clearly a great deal of money behind biotech, agribusiness, and energy companies to advance their goals in Congress and at the state level. And clearly they have significant influence resulting in clear impacts that affect the public and environmental health. 
That's why it's so important for you to be involved. Whether it's taking a few minutes to make a phone call, attending a meeting, or asking questions of a candidate, OFA is also here to help. If you would like to organize a meeting with a local legislator in your community, but aren't sure about where to start, please feel free to call OFA. We can help with setting things up, identifying other folks in your community that may also be interested in participating, and possibly send staff to help facilitate the meeting. So why is advocacy so important? You can see that there's a few examples on your screen of different types of successes that we've seen from advocacy. For example, after decades of advocacy by farmers and healthy food advocates, the Organic Foods Production Act was signed into law 25 years ago. That was a huge success that led to the development of the National Organic Program and the ability for consumers to go into a grocery store or a farmer's market, see the organic seal, and know that food was produced under very specific conditions. The second example of RBGH, a recombinant bovine growth hormone used in dairy production, was something that people didn't know whether or not that was used in the milk they produced until advocates put pressure on state departments of agriculture and others saying that they wanted to know when that hormone was used in milk. A current example of advocacy involves communities across the state of Ohio right now that are advocating to ban the injection of underground waste. These are hazardous wastes from the fracking industry where we've experienced many kinds of accidents and communities are taking um, action and taking control by trying to ban those kind of activities. And then finally, this is a point of pride for the state of Ohio. We lead the nation in the number of local food policy councils, a way for people in their community to take real action on food and agricultural issues at the local level. So these are just a few examples of not just why advocacy is important, but it's of some of the ongoing issues and some of the wins that we've seen through advocacy. So an important question when you're wanting to advocate is, you know, what really works? A report called the Advocacy Gap found that while advocacy is getting louder, it's not necessarily getting more effective. The report found that personalized messages are much more effective than form letters or emails. In fact, using the example that we talked about earlier, if you submitted a form letter with 1,000 signatures to a federal agency to comment on a regulation, that is only considered to be one comment. A personalized phone call where you can share your interests, your associations, and the memberships you belong to, and why the issue matters to you is incredibly impactful. Another important tip is to do the research on your member of Congress or your state representative to try and find out what their stance is on the policy that you care about and connect the issue to something that is a priority for them. The report also found that it's really important when you're engaging with your representatives not to call about very broad general issues. You want to call about policies, about pending legislation, something they can take action on. Always have an ask 
when you call, write, or meet with your member of Congress. Meeting with your representative when they're home in the district where you live is really more effective than a lot of what happens in Washington, D.C. Local events, media coverage, and meetings are most effective. Again, you don't need to go to Washington, D.C. to make a difference or to Columbus for that matter. Your legislator has a district office close to you. Take advantage of when the legislature is on recess to meet with members in district. Tell them what policies you want them to support or oppose when they go back to the legislature. And this point is really important. Personal stories that connect something, um, connect to something that your representative cares about are the single most effective tactic for moving a legislator to support a policy. So really telling your heartfelt story makes a difference. And again, while this advocacy gap report was written from the federal legislative perspective, the same holds true for state efforts. You can connect with your representative in the district where you live, share your personal story, why the issue matters to you, and connect it to your representative in direct phone calls, meetings, or when attending events in, their, in your district. So one of the first things that you really need to do when you're engaging with your representative is know who those people are. So you can see that I'm putting something up in your screen and there's a link to this on the presentation. This is um, a website from Common Cause where you can go find your elected officials. And what you will just do is type in your address, including your city, state, and zip code. And I'm going to go ahead and get that in here so you can see what this looks like. Definitely want to include the postal code. And this will come up with a listing of who your elected officials are. And you can see that in my home district, it'll show President, Vice President, our Senator Sheridan Brown and Rob Portman, and your congressional rep, followed by your state reps. And I think they've got a wrong picture here, but I've got Jay Hottinger as a state senator and Scott Ryan is the Ohio representative. So again, go to the Common Cause website, enter your address, and you can find that information about um, your legislators. After you do find out who that person is, it's best to call their office and ask who's the legislative aide in charge of the issue that you're calling about. Again, a lot of time, you will not be talking directly with the representative, but getting to know their staff. So now you're getting ready to make that phone call. What do you do? When you make the call, you want to clearly state who you are, where you live. Again, I'm a constituent in the district, and what your affiliations are. Again, those memberships and organizations that you're involved in mean that you have a large sphere of influence, and that makes a difference in them paying attention to what your ask is. You're going to share why you're calling, why the issue matters to you, and if you don't already know, ask what their position is on the issue. You're going to make your ask and share that personal story, how it relates to you and your family, why they should support or oppose the bill or take the action that you're requesting. I think it's really helpful to see an example of someone making that call. 
So what you're going to see on your screen next is a wonderful short video that's provided by one of our sister organizations, the Carolina Farm Stewardship Association. So I'm going to let you just sit back and listen to this phone call. Let's call your representative. Legislators need to know what their communities want and need from their state government. So your voice is important. Register to vote. Do a little homework before you call. Know the name of the bill and the bill number. Is it a House bill or a Senate bill? Be polite to the legislator's staff. This is the person who will pass on your information. We want them sympathetic about your call. Identify yourself as a constituent. Tell them why you care about the bill. Explain how the bill impacts you or your business. Tell them how you want them to vote. Good afternoon, Claire. My name is Rochelle Martin. I'm a constituent of Larry Hall's. I'm calling today about House Bill 1050, on the best tax law changes. The bill is up for a vote in the House later this week. I'm a beginning farmer. I just started my farm last year. As a new farmer, I have to buy a lot of equipment to get up and running. I only earned about $10,000 from the farm last year. This bill is going to mean that I'll have to pay sales tax for farm equipment that more established farmers don't have to pay. This bill is going to make it really hard for me to get my business off the ground. Please ask Representative Paul to vote against this bill. Your voice matters. Let them hear it. So that's a really wonderful little video. And just for your reference, that video is archived on OFA's website. If you're interested in going back and listening to that a second or a third time, just so you can see how to best make that first phone call. So at this point, I'd actually like to turn our audio over to Jazz Glastra. Jazz was an intern at OFA. She did a fabulous job in helping us in a lot of different ways. Jazz is also a student who's become active in calling and developing relationships with her representatives. So she's going to talk for a few minutes about what it was like for her to make that first phone call and share any tips that she may have. So Jazz, we're going to turn it over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Um, as Emily said, my name is Jazz, and I'm currently a master's student at Ohio State in rural sociology. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about my experience with calling some legislators. So oftentimes I'll get emails that say, we need you to call your representative right away. And what that actually means is we need you to call your representative's unpaid college intern more than likely. Um, so I just wanted everybody to know that this shouldn't be an intimidating experience. Um, you don't, well, you do want to do your homework and make sure you know kind of what your talking points are and what your ask is before you make the call. There's nothing to be um, scared about. Usually the person answering the phone is an intern or a staffer, um, and they're not the actual representatives themselves, if that makes you feel a little better. So my experience generally, um, it can be a little bit awkward as, you know, it's, it's not really a, a regular conversation. It's more um, just you speaking and somebody takes notes on what you, what you say and uh, generally they just thank you and, and that's about it. So it's a pretty simple interaction. Um, so typically they'll just answer the phone and say, oh, Senator you know, Portman's office, for example, how can I help you? Um, you want to introduce yourself very briefly, and as Emily already mentioned, make sure they know you're a constituent. Um, you sort of deliver your comments and then um, and then hang up, and it's pretty simple. Sometimes when you get a voicemail, um, you just want to make sure that you are pretty concise because I think there's like a usually about a two-minute limit. Sometimes you will get voicemail. Um, you may want to try back and try to get a real person. I've done both. I've left voicemails and I've also called back. Um, but even on the voicemail, don't forget to introduce yourself. Um, another thing that should kind of make you feel a little comfortable is knowing that you will not have to debate anybody, and this is not a test of how much you know about a specific issue. Um, this is just your opportunity to make your own voice heard. 
likely what will happen after you uh, make the call is you'll get some sort of a follow-up letter or email, sometimes weeks or months after the fact, sometimes after you've forgotten what it was that you called about in the very first place. Um, so that's that's about it. It's a pretty simple process. Um, just my tips for sort of preparation. I would write out a couple of talking points ahead of time because you do want to be concise and you want them to know exactly what it is that you're asking. Um, know the bill by name um, that you are referencing and exactly how you want them to vote. Um, so have them say yay or nay as opposed to vote you know, for labeling or against labeling, because that, I think that can get a little confusing. Um, so I always find it easiest to just state the name of the bill and how I would like them to vote first um, and get that out of the way, and then I follow up with kind of my explanation. Um, I know, I think that Bill kind of had it the other way, or excuse me, that video had it a little bit the other way around, but really it's just whatever you're comfortable with. And um, as I said before, I think the first couple times I did it, it, it felt a little awkward, but now that I've made um, many calls over the past few years, I've gotten a lot more comfortable with it, and it really is something that you can do with just a couple of minutes out of your day. It's not something that takes a ton of preparation, and if you do feel strongly about an issue, I would strongly encourage you to um, start making calls and just kind of dip your toes in the legislative process that way. So I think I think that's about all I had to say, Emily. I'll Unmuted. Back to you. Thanks so much, Jazz. You know, I think it's a really important perspective just to hear what it's like to go through that the first time. And and as Jazz said, you know, the more you make those calls, the more you interact and develop relationships with some of their staff, you'll find it's really an easy process, and it's a really critical, important process right now. Um, there are a number of resources we just wanted to make sure that you were aware of. A few of them are listed on the screen, but there are many more resources available on the OFA website. Um, I mentioned earlier the Questions for Candidates Guide. That's going to really be an important resource for the 2016 election. Again, as I mentioned, you know, if you are interested in getting more specific resources and specific types of training or assistance, please contact us and let us know. A really important tool that is on the OFA website is our Advocacy Toolkit webpage. On that Advocacy Toolkit webpage, we have action alerts, news bulletins, and a host of resources, including how to write a letter to the editor, which is another really important advocacy and educational tool. So there's that and a lot more on the OPA's website. I really encourage you to check out that resource. So we've talked a little bit about what advocacy is, the education, lobbying, research, litigation, rallies, and other types of tools for policy engagement. We talked about why advocacy is really needed right now. We have so many pressing issues related to food and agriculture right now. Things like um, hiding the public's right to know what they eat and feed their families by a bill that passed the legislature. Um, prohibiting GE labeling. There are threats to organic and sustainable farms from the oil and gas industry's use of fracking. We have a lot of impacts from climate change and, and many more, more issues. Your involvement is really needed right now. You can make a real difference. We talked a little bit about the how of advocacy and that really focused tonight on identifying who your legislators are, starting to call their offices and develop relationships. That's really the first step to getting engaged. If you would like to be more involved, OFA has several working groups where members are actively engaged in different campaigns and we're always looking for more help and more regional representation. Please give us a call. 
At this point, we're going to open it up to questions. So if anybody does have a question, please um, type that into the question box and we'll do our best to go ahead and answer that. And I want to make sure to, um, to remind everybody that we are having that two-hour intensive advocacy training at the next OFA conference in February of 2016. So that's a great opportunity to be more engaged. Does anybody have any questions for us tonight? So as I mentioned, you know, anytime you can be involved or have a question, please feel free to give us a call. Let's see, I think we've got a question here from Jazz. Talk about what's going to be in that two-hour training. So for the advocacy training at the next OFA conference, we are going to be having some great staff from the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. It's really going to be a very hands-on training so that during that session you'll have different opportunities to practice different kinds of advocacy, maybe prepare a draft letter to the editor, maybe um, talk about you know being involved in a meeting. So while we don't have a lot of um, specifics, we do have um, it's going to be, again, a very kind of hands-on training. So there's a question from Nancy about how effective it is to sign online petitions. That's a really good question, Nancy. I know we get those kinds of, um, those kinds of requests on a regular basis from many different kinds of organizations. Certainly, the quick answer is it, it doesn't cost a lot for us to sign an online petition for something that's important to us. So I would not discourage you from doing it, but I would say that there are much more effective ways, such as making phone calls, attending meetings, writing letters to the editor, things like that, that will have much more of an impact. So it looks like we've got another question here from Marty. Um, what are the uh, current OFA working groups? Uh, how are they publicized and how can members get involved? So right now, the working groups that OFA has, we have two that are currently active. One that is working um, on fracking issues. Again, for those of you who aren't aware, fracking is high pressure hydraulic fracking currently being used by the oil and gas industry, something that we've had a number of accidents around the state over the past several years. And so we've got a group of folks that are really having uh, phone calls on a regular basis to talk about what's happening, to talk about ways people can be more involved in local communities. And certainly Marty is one of our more active members of really engaging the local community. So Marty, we could have you talk about that at some point, certainly. Um, we also have a, a work group that is focused on issues around genetic engineering. You know, do we, you know, we definitely want to have GMO labeling. We want the right to know when there is the presence of GE ingredients in the food that we eat. So those are the two most active working groups right now. Um, really, if you want to be involved, just shoot me an email, which is on the screen, and I'd be glad to add you to those working groups. Um, again, it's really very convenient because a large uh, part of the time we do it uh, over the phone, so it's not like you have to travel anywhere to be part of these meetings. And one of the things that we'll probably be more involved in in the future is issues around crop insurance. That's something that is what they call more of a big picture structural issue that affects a lot of what we eat and a lot of what happens on the landscape. So that's a little bit of an overview of kind of some opportunities for more involvement. And it doesn't matter where you live in the state of Ohio, um, you certainly can be involved from wherever that is. Um, if you are a member of OFA, 
Um, you receive newsletters on a quarterly basis, but you'll also receive monthly policy bulletins. And that's a really great way to stay up to date on things that are happening at the local, state, or federal level. Um, again, that monthly policy bulletin is a really informative uh, uh, piece of information that can keep you up to date on what's happening in a lot of the issues related to food and agriculture. So again, just a quick thank you to everybody who joined our webinar tonight. And in closing, just know that this webinar is also going to be posted on OFA's website, most likely on our Advocacy Toolkit webpage. If you have other friends or family that you think might like to be more involved in the political process, please feel free. Um, you'll get some links to information. Um, refer them to the YOFA website, and they're more than welcome to view this advocacy training webinar anytime, any place. And again, please feel free to stay involved with us and let us know how we can help you more effectively advocate. Thank you all so much.